ago, she created this grassroots organization called Greater Georgia. Year-round campaign infrastructure, really something that conservatives haven't Great. recently. All right. And we're hey, recording. Hi, my name is Denise Reagan. I'm the executive director of the Garden Club, and I'm here to welcome you to Combined Circles, Bartram Trail Tales. Yay! Uh, as I said, I'm Denise Reagan. I'm the executive director of the Garden Club, and I'm here with Daniel Stark, our operations manager, who's helping run this Zoom program. We couldn't do programs like this without the help of the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, who's very generous grant, um, help us uh, do hybrid programs just like this one. And I'd like to thank Connie Long, our Combined Circles Chair, who put together this program and uh, another one that's coming up uh, in just a little bit in March, Flower Power, featuring Jan Silic, our own Jan Silic. Um, and we're so excited because she's going to be doing some really outrageous contemporary designs. Um, and you'll learn um, how, how they come up with those ideas. And uh, we're so excited to have her. So look for that. That is March 8th. March 8th. All right. Um, so now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers. First, Sam Carr is a retired district manager for Ford Motor. Yeah. Let me start that over again because I can't speak. Sam Carr is a retired district manager for Ford Motor Company and now spends his time enjoying and promoting the St. John's River. The St. John's Riverkeeper recently recognized him as the St. John's River Advocate of the Year. He enjoys fishing from his kayak and exploring the outdoors with his grandchildren and wife of 37 years, Lorraine. He chaired a committee to establish the Bartram Trail in Putnam County and served two terms as a governor's appointment to the Florida Greenways and Trails Council. Sam is the president of the Bartram Trail Conference and the Bartram Trail Society of Florida. He is pursuing the establishment of the Bartram Trail National Heritage Corridor, covering all 2,500 miles of Bartram's travels throughout the Southeast. Sam's experiences with establishing trails and collaborations with groups has led him to working with agencies such as the Department of Environmental Protection, the Florida Park Service, and the Florida Humanities Council, and the Department of the Interior. We also have Mike Adams, Mike Adams is a conservation ecologist, researcher, educator, and author. He holds a bachelor's degree in biology with studies in anthropology and a master's degree in environmental management. He has lived and worked in Northeast Florida for 41 years, spanning roles in state government, consulting, education, and nonprofits. In semi-retirement, he and his wife of 31 years, Carol, manage and reside on Satariwa private <laughs> conservation area. I hope I did not mess that up along the St. John's River. He provides conservation and ecological lectures and tours, writes a nature column for a local newspaper, serves as vice president of the Bartram Trail Society of Florida, and volunteers for Marineland Right Whale Project, St. John's Riverkeeper, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and Florida Forest Service. In 2018, he received the prestigious Stetson Kennedy Foundation Fellow Man and Mother Earth Award. He brings natural history to life with his colorful and exciting portrayals of colonial naturalist, William Bartram, which you will get to see today. All right, so now I would like to turn this over to Sam and Mike. Oh, and let me remind you, if you have a, anything that makes a sound, now's a good time to go ahead and quiet it, all right? Take it away, Sam and Mike. Oh, let me also say, if you have questions for them, um, please save them to the end, but whether you're on Zoom or here in person, and uh, we will uh, get them get to them afterward. Thank you. Well, thank you, Denise. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation this morning. Both Sam and I are really excited to be here and and thrilled that you all have come out of hibernation this winter to uh, to listen to our presentation. And I think you're going to learn a lot. We have a lot of things to talk about with the natural history of the St. John's River and particularly what uh, me, William Bartram, was encountering in his travels back in 1774. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to take you back in time, and I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've been seeing and encountering along the way. My presentation as William Bartram will be the first half of our overall talk, and then Sam Carr will talk about the legacy of William Bartram and perhaps how you can get involved in the future. Next slide, please. 
There's a little bit about the character. Denise gave a great introduction. Sometimes you wonder who they're talking about when you hear all that information, but uh, it's, it's quite amazing all the same. Next, please. So this is what's happening in my travels throughout the 13 colonies back in 1774. I first came through this area with my father, John, in 1766. And we came down and we were exploring the East Florida Territory and the Wallaca, which is native for the St. John's River, which means river of lakes, the Wallaca. And you see on this particular slide, there's a lot of things going on in the bark that I have there. Let's go back, please. There we go. There we go. Oh, there we go. These newfangled technological devices. I'll just talk about it. So if you look at that piece of artwork, you'll see that there's a lot of things happening in my bark or the boat. So what happens is, as I'm coming down, my father has a herbarium in the town of Philadelphia in the Pennsylvania colony. I come by ship to the town of Charlestown in the South Carolina colony. Some of you may have heard of it. By ship, disembark there and get on horseback and come down to the village of Savannah in the Georgia colony. From there, I do a survey with quite an entourage that proceeds upstream in the Savannah River to the Appalachians, the foothills. Do some exploring and documenting there and I come down and then we go to a place that will become known as Darien, Georgia, in the marshes of the Southeast Georgia colony. I met a fellow there at a plantation, the McIntosh Plantation, young Mr. McIntosh, about an 18 year old young man. He was curious about my journey. He wanted to accompany me down into the East Florida Territory. I said, certainly you can join. So we came down and we crossed in the town of Calford. Some of you may know this place where the river is real narrow, not too far from where we are right now, only about a half a mile from here. We crossed there by ferry and met another plantation owner that was quite receptive to us, very hospitable, but he was advising that if we're going to explore the Wallaca or River of Lakes, we should go by boat. So this is what I ended up with. And if you look closely at that artwork, you'll see a plant press. You'll see barrels with food supplies like rice and bacon. If you look really close, you'll see a dog in there for companionship. And if you look really close, there's some things going on there. There's some raccoons in the background and some birds flying in the background, that type of thing. So it's quite an amazing piece of artwork. And it just gives you an idea of how light I'm traveling in this boat. Next slide, please. If you can see this, this is the map of my travels in the Southeast colonies. 1774. You see in red there, that's the journey. And it shows going up the Savannah River, coming back down, coming down through the village of Darien, through Calford, and then I'm in the East Florida Territory on the Wallaca. Now, one thing that I learned along the way, and I'm keeping notes and doing sketches along the way. You all knew about those sketches, right? And some of the notes. I hope to publish this in, in some not too far years ahead, we'll see how that goes. But one creature that I encountered not far from after I was in this boat, by the way, this boat was about, this gentleman right here, it was about this long distance between him and I, this boat, and it was rigged with a sail. So I could sail it, or I could use oars if it wasn't a windy enough day. And I did both, I did both. But what happened was, Remember I was telling you about young Mr. McIntosh? Well, when we got to Calford, he didn't want to come along with me. I said, fine, you can stay in Calford. I guess he wanted some big city opportunities, whatever may be there at that time. But what I wanted to share with you was, I encountered a creature as soon as I got into the Wallaca that I had never seen before. Now I had read some Chinese literature the closest thing that I could compare this creature to were Chinese dragons. Chinese dragons. And this animal 
was almost as long as my bark. And he tried to get into the boat. In fact, he got one leg up on the side. I had to dispatch this creature. Quite an amazing animal. I'll talk about that a little later. Next slide, please. This particular sketch here that I've drawn, I actually have a piece of artwork right up here on this side. So you're welcome to come up and take a look after our presentations and take a closer look. But we're very proud of these pieces of artwork. These actually came from the Natural History Museum in London. And the Bartram Trail Society of Florida is one of the only organizations in the United States that has these. It's quite amazing. These are rare pieces of artwork and they're copies of actual sketches that I did in the field. This particular one you'll see here, many of you may recognize this. This is one of our carnivorous plants. It's called the hooded pitcher plant. The hooded pitcher plant. And you see there the stem, it's got a long stem that's open on the top and the stem is hollow. And there's nectar down at the base of this hollow stem. So what happens is the opening on the top, the insect will come in, the insect will come in attracted to the nectar. And if you look closely, you might not be able to see it on that image, but on the opposite side of the opening of the top of the pitcher plant, is translucent tissue and it allows light to come in. And this light to come in appears like a window, except the window is closed. <laughs> the insect goes down and gets the nectar, comes back up. It has a 50-50 chance of turning the right direction to exit out through the entrance, which is where he came in. Or if it tries to go to those windows, the windows are closed. The insect gets exhausted, collapses, crashes down at the bottom. And by the way, that sweet nectar is part digestive juices as well for the plant. But what's really interesting, next slide, please. What's really interesting, here's some kind of things I'm gonna be comparing in my presentation, something called photographs compared to my sketches. And the one that you just see come up on the screen there is an actual photograph of the hooded pitcher plant, and you'll notice that it's green. Now, by virtue of speaking to a garden club, you ladies and gentlemen know what green part of the plant is. It's chlorophyll, a product of photosynthesis, which is gathering energy from the sun. So not only is the hooded pitcher plant a carnivorous plant, but it also gets energy from the sun and produces chlorophyll. Quite an amazing plant indeed. Next slide, please. This is a piece of artwork that I'm really proud of. You notice there's a lot of things going on in this particular piece of artwork. I combined many subjects. I combined many subjects in here to include the pitcher plant that you'll see a couple different species on there. The erect one on the left side of the picture there is the hooded pitcher plant. The one that's in repose horizontally is another type of a pitcher plant that is found more in the western part of the East Florida Territory. Saracenia flava, if you're looking for a genus and species. But there's a lot of things going on in that, in that piece of artwork, and I'd like to point out some predation. If you look really closely there, there's a snake with a frog in capture, okay? You look really close, you'll see a snail, several species of snail. That plant in the background is the water lotus. Some of you may know that, the American lotus. If you look really close in the lower left, you'll see something that I put in there just for fun, ants and a small lizard after the ants. So there's a lot of predation going on in this particular piece of artwork. I'm really proud of it. I hope to include this in my book as well. We'll see how that ends up. Next slide, please. Now here's one. Some of you may know about this one as well. It will become known as the Florida pawpaw. And we just happen to have the original artwork right up here as well. Again, you can take a look after the presentations and get a really good look at these. But this is a particular plant that grows in the uplands as I've been exploring. 
And it's quite a beautiful plant. It produces a fruit that the Indians have been telling me is edible. Quite amazing. And it has a very showy white blossom and it blooms in the very early spring. Next slide. There's one of those live photographs. And you'll see what it looks like. The actual plant of the Florida pawpaw, you see how it relates to my sketch. So what I'm hoping you're get a getting a sense of here a little bit is the accuracy of my sketches and my drawings to what the plants actually look like out in the field. Next slide, please. Now, those of you that have perhaps heard of Billy Bartram, you may have some expectations or visions of being a plant person. But I appreciated birds. Actually, I appreciated all forms of life. And that's also part of my survey that I'm doing. By the way, I did not mention that this journey that I'm on, I'm on commission from a physician in London, England, a fellow named Dr. John Fothergill. And his mission is for me to survey these resources and see what kind of agricultural opportunities, what kind of development opportunities, what kind of plants may be available for medicinal values. And so I'm sketching these, describing these, even collecting samples and sending back to Dr. Fothergill in London. What I wanna show you in this one is, I'm sketching other things besides plants. You see in this particular sketch is a bird, a little green heron, one of our wetland birds. Anybody study birds in here as well as gardens? A few people, excellent, excellent. So you may know this bird. This bird you would see commonly along the Wallaca, right out here along the shoreline. Next slide. One of those photographs. That's what he looks like in real life. Little green heron. Next slide. And this is another one that I've drawn sketches of and that I've encountered along the way, Phalia. This is a wetland plant, very tall, very tall and robust. And this is a wetland plant that I've been encountering along the way. It has beautiful red flowers. And I have sketches of this one as well. Next slide. This is one called the fever bark. And this is one that grows in upland areas. You see the showy flower there. Next slide. That's actually a colorized sketch. Now I must say, when I'm out in the field and you see how I was traveling in my bark, very limited supplies and resources, all my sketches were with charcoal pencils. And I, what, I refer to it as being colorized back at the herbarium. And you see this one is an example of a colorized plant that I enhanced back in the herbarium. And the photograph is the actual fever bark blossom. Very beautiful. Next slide. And there's the actual, what the, what the plant looks like with the morphology of the leaves. And it's, it's like a shrub, really. It's like a shrub. Next slide. Uh, this is one. If you've read anything or studied anything about William Bartram, this is one of the signature plants, the Bartram Zixia. And we are in the heart of Bartram Ixia range, right in this area here, not within an urbanized area, but more in the pine forests that surround this area and that were part of this area, perhaps before all the development. But this particular plant, it only blooms one morning a year. One morning a year. Next slide. And like I say, it's been drawn and painted and sketched and described in many places. This is down in the village that will become known as Palatka, that will become known as the city of murals on a mural. This is a picture of the Bartram Zixia. Next slide. This is an actual photograph. Now there's two species of Ixia. One blooms in the spring and another one blooms in the fall. I was encountering the spring blooming species. This particular one 
is a fall blooming species. And you'll notice the petals are a bit more pointed. Next slide. There's the spring blooming species. Notice the rounded petals. Spectacular all the same. But this is one, if you ever have a hope and a chance of going out to trying to find this one, you have to go early in the morning, you have to have a rough idea of where they are, and you have to go in the right time of year, which is about April, May, that type of thing for the spring blooming one, and September and October for the fall blooming Ixia. Next slide. And there's a close up. You see it's a very spectacular flower, very delicate, very delicate as well. Next slide. Now this is one, and it reminds me of your Gordonia. Is it your newsletter you were saying? It's, it's a logo on your newsletter, which is the, the artwork that you have on the back of the room here, Loblolly Bay. This particular flower, my father and I named Franklinia. Now, I perhaps should have mentioned that my father, John, is one of the forefathers in the Philadelphia town, and he knows many people there, to include a gentleman named Ben. Benjamin Franklin, very good friends of the family. Well, when we encountered this plant first in 1766 in Southeast Georgia along the Alta Hamaha River in Southeast Georgia, not far from Darien, if you've ever been up that way, we first caught this plant my father sent me back in 1774 to do collections and drawings and more advanced descriptions. And that's what I did. And this is the colorized version. And if you study that very closely, it looks very similar to your Gordonia or Loblolly Bay blossom. Next slide, please. And there's the actual photograph. Quite amazing. Now. As far as science will know in, in the future, this plant will be extinct in the field, but because of the collections that I made in 1774 and took them back to the herbarium, we have cultivated those. And in modern times, there will only be cultivated specimens of the Franklinia. Next slide, please. In fact, this is a photograph of the Bartram's Gardens in Philadelphia along the Schuylkill River, if anybody knows that neck of the woods. It used to be King Sessing. Now, perhaps the city of Philadelphia has swallowed it up. But there's a 50-acre garden there with the herbarium, and you see that, that small tree in the foreground there. That's, a, that's an actual Franklinia plant. And I believe, I'm not certain, but a famous American took that photo, who I'll introduce later. Next slide, please. Now, this is one, again, I had been mentioning about sketching plants. This is one that I included several species of plants and one bird there, okay? You see down in the bottom, there's a sea star. There's a sea urchin. There's some cone shells over on one side. And of course, the bird is a marsh bird. Next slide, please one of those composites. Now, this was what I was describing to you earlier. These were the Chinese dragons that I first encountered. That plantation owner that built the boat for me, the sailboat, when I first came across at Calford, he warned me of these creatures, referred to them as something like agitated. But if you say this, this drawing, it's attic. There's a lot of things going on in this drawing. And some people, some scientists, and maybe some art aficionados say that these particular creatures, they don't do these. They don't get in these positions. They don't get in these postures. Well, let me tell you, let me assure you, I have seen these animals in all these positions. You see the head raised up with a fish in there, the water draining out of the sides. I've seen that. You see the one on the bottom with the back up out of the water and the back is shimmering and vibrating. The water comes up off the back of the animal. It's quite dramatic. With the tail up on one side, just like the picture shows. 
I was in a place along the Wallaca that got narrowed, very similar to Calford here. And at certain times of the year, these animals would congregate in this area because the fish would migrate through. And there were several places along the Wallaca where these animals were so dense along the banks of the river, I could have walked on their backs. There were so many of them. I think future research will determine at major universities that this artwork is actually quite indicative of how these animals behave. I think this animal will become known as the alligator. And they are quite populous in the Wallaca. Next slide, please. Now, we're talking about the travels in what will become known as Duval County. I'd like to read to you some excerpts of what I've written about this particular area. In three days after leaving Amelia, we arrived at the Cowford, the public ferry over St. John's about 30 miles above the bar or capes. The river here is being above a mile wide. Mr. Egan, remember I talked about the plantation owner? After procuring a neat little sailboat for me at a large indigo plantation near the ferry and for which I paid three guineas, departed for St. Augustine, which is on the seacoast about 45 miles over land. Next slide. Whilst I continued impelled by the restless spirit of curiosity in pursuit of new productions of nature, my chief, chief happiness consisted of tracing and admiring the infinite power, majesty, and perfection of the great almighty creator. And in the contemplation and through divine aid and permission, I might be instrumental in discovering and introducing into my not native country some original productions of nature which might become useful to society. What am I describing there? The artwork. Next, please. My little vessel being furnished with a good sail and having fishing tackle a neat little fusies. Do you know what those are? Muskets. Powder and ball. I find myself well equipped for my voyage about a hundred miles to the trading house. Now that's upstream. We'll talk about that later. Next slide, please. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I've just given you a thumbnail sketch about what I've been encountering along the way. And I'm not sure, in 1774, with all my notes and sketches and shipments back to Dr. Fothergill, I'm hoping to produce a book. And I think I'll call this something like The Travels of William Bartram, and then there's like a paragraph in the title after that. I really made a long title on this one, but the short version is The Travels of William Bartram. And I hope it gets published around 1791. I'm not exactly sure of that. But I would encourage you to, if, if I've piqued your interest, and my good friend Sam Carr is going to talk about a little different aspect about the legacy. If we've piqued your interest, I would encourage you to get a copy of this book, if in fact it was published, and take a closer look and learn more about what kind of an amazing resource was in this area that probably still is in this area. Because if you all live around here, this resource out here, this St. John's River, it's amazing. And I suppose, I assume that by virtue of you living in this area, you appreciate it as much as Sam and I do. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure speaking with you this morning. My name is Billy Bartram. I appreciate you listening to me. At this time, I'd like to introduce a very good friend of mine and another famous American, Professor Sam Carr. Yeah, well. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Uh, how much fun is it to travel with this guy? It really does. And, and he's been really instrumental in, in what all is going on with the Bartram Trail, um, all up and down uh, across this, the state of Florida, especially. And, all, and his knowledge of plants and all of that kind of stuff fits so well. And to have the inspiration of, um, of the original Billy Bartram is, uh, is really, really neat. And he's the main uh, star at our annual uh, St. John's River Bartram Frolic that we have down in Palatka every single year. And so he has trained over 500 second graders in Putnam. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's 500 at a time. So, so uh, we've done about 2,500 kids uh, and trained them on just exactly what you heard, the plants, animals, and uh, the nature of the St. John's River. And so he does that with us. It's really, really neat. So thank you. Thank you, Billy. So uh, I am, uh, I am the, the, um, the president of the Bartram Trail Society of Florida, which we'll talk about again a little later. And I'm also the president of the Bartram Trail Conference, which is a national kind of group is the way of looking at it. And, um, and so I got started with this whole Bartram thing because I live on the St. John's River. And uh, my friend, Dean Campbell, who lives up here, he, he asked me to come paddling up and down the St. John's. And as go, going down the St. John's, he said, oh, Bartram did that over here. Oh, Bartram did that over here. Oh, there's Stokes Landing. That's where the Spalding's up lower store was. Oh, there's Dunn's Creek. And oh, there's Murphy Island. There, Dunn's Creek, Murphy Island. I can see those from my house. And so I said, really? He said, yeah. And so I started reading the book and got absolutely infatuated knowing that Billy Bartram and his father, John, had paddled past my house at least six or eight times and, 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 and had stories about all these places that I was very familiar with. And so uh, with that, then the county of Putnam said, did anything famous happen in Palak? And I said, well, uh, yeah. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and so they said, well, okay, you're chairman of the committee. So to go out and do something. And so we did. We went out and found 31 locations in Putnam County alone that Bartram actually wrote about, either in his travels or in his journal. And uh, we put a stake in the ground and we created what we call the Bartram Trail in Putnam County. And that's when the Bartram Trail Conference called me up and said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, okay, we've, we've already done it. So that's kind of how I wound up connected here. So let's go on and I'll tell you all about that. So the Bartram Trail Society was reformed in 2019 for the purpose of developing the Bartram Trail in Florida by working with various groups and so forth. Uh, the Bartram Trail Conference, uh, we, we are, the Bartram Trail Conference is really first affiliate. We started uh, uh, affiliates and we were the very first one. It's basically the Florida branch of the Bartram Trail Conference is who we are. And um, we annually conduct the St. John's River Bartram Frolic in Palatka. The next one, put it on your calendar, April 23rd, 24th. Um, that's uh, also Bartram birthday is April 20th. So we choose that weekend to do that. It's also Earth Day week, right? So, um, so we, we do that and we have a big uh, uh, festival on Saturday and then on Sunday we have a Bartram Symposium which we bring scholars from all over uh, on to talk about uh, Bartram stuff and it's really, really fun. We have a, have a great time and we'll send you all the information to the club about that later. The Bartram Trail Conference, however, was formed in, 17, in 1975 and um, it, it, what we've done is we, we, we formed this. We actually formed it as a result of the, let's see, it's called the Deep South Garden. Yeah. That's who actually formed the Bartram Trail Conference. So we're a product of you guys. And, uh, and, and uh, it started. And so uh, the idea was we needed to have a central organization to establish a Bartram Trail all the way across the 2,500 miles. And so that's, that was the purpose of the Bartram Trail Conference. And it works to promote an interest in developing public access to recreational trails and, um, and, uh, and botanical gardens within the corridor of the Bartram's route through the individual states, there's seven states, and to coordinate the effort. That's what we're about is the, is the whole, whole big show, okay? And um, 
the next biennial meeting, by the way, if you want to go and want to come to visit Mr. McIntosh's grounds, we're going to be in Darien, Georgia on January the 28th and 29th, and we're actually going to go look for Billy's Franklinia. So uh, <laughs> we're actually doing that, and it's really, really going to be cool. And people from Philadelphia are coming down, and, and we've, got, we've located the locale and all that kind of stuff, so it should be a party. So uh, we'll, we'll have that. So the Barsham Trail Conference, um, his mission is to finish what the Deep South Garden Clubs and the Florida Federation of Garden Clubs started back in 1976. And so there are 30 Barsham Trail markers that you guys have put up in the state of Florida alone. There's 80 some odd of them all the way across the Southeast creating the Barsham Trail. And we'll, um, um, we establish affiliates to help us do this. And, um, and we'll, if you're interested, see me, okay? Um, so how did the garden clubs get involved with this thing? So let's go to the next slide. Um, so in, uh, in 1978, I'm gonna have to have glasses to read this. Okay, uh, this is, a, this is a, cop, a copy of a letter that was written by the Deep South Garden Club in 1978. It says, it's truly felt that the garden clubs of the Southern region have provided the impetus, effort, and seed money to get a tremendous project underway. Trails are unique to America, and when the 2,500 miles of the Barsham Trail have been constructed, it will become a permanent heritage for the America, one that the garden clubs can, very, can well be very proud of taking part in creating. And that was how it all started. Next slide. Uh, does anyone know of Helen Cruikshank? Anybody ever heard of her? Wow. We've got young garden club members here because Helen Cruikshank was the, was the, was the uh, very famous person with the, with the garden clubs here in Florida. She wrote a book, and the book of that is called Bartram's Travels in Florida, 1774. And next slide. Um, this is what she says. She says, um, 21 Bartram markers now grace Florida highways, parks, and other sites. These gifts to the people of Florida and its visitors from the members clubs of the Florida Federation of Garden Clubs, Floridians who see the markers will take pride in our very state. Hopefully they will be challenged to read Bartram's travels in its entirety. So that was Helen Cruikshank's book that she wrote detailing um, the, the reason for these trail markers. Next slide. So in the state of Florida, this is what these trail markers look like. They're all over the place. Starts in Amelia Island where you came on. It goes all the way down to Deland, to, to um, the Garden Club in Deland has, has their marker down there. We've got two garden clubs in Orlando. They said, shoot, he got close. Let's put up a marker. And so... so even though we didn't go there, we did. And so you see them all the way over in, in, um, in the Titusville area in St. Augustine, all the way across uh, the state to uh, the, the Suwannee River, and uh, in particular, Gainesville and Payne's Prairie is where he spent quite a bit of time. So all of these markers were placed by, by the Federation of uh, Florida Federation of Garden Clubs. And um, some of them are still in repair. The one here in Jacksonville is actually in the, the science museum over there in storage. We need to get it out, you know, and, and it's there, and, uh, and, it, and it needs to be placed right where it is, because that's Calford. That's where he crossed the river and came aboard and everything, and then, of course, we've got the, the memorial, the highway, and it has several markers on it, too, so that's what, that's what exists now, so the Bartram Trail exists, and that's what it looks like, according to the Garden Clubs. Next slide. Now, what does the Bartram Heritage Corridor look like? So what we found out was that we, we can't have a contiguous trail, right? Because by 95 and I-10 and Highway 20 and Highway 46 and, and all of that, all of the Indian trails that Bartram traveled on are now highways. And so there's, it's not like the Lewis and Clark Trail, which there is a contiguous trail for, so we had to, so the National Park Service had to create what they call heritage corridor, corridors or heritage areas. You may be familiar with the Gullah Geechee Heritage Area. And so that's, that's kind of what the designation that we're, we're seeking here. 
But as you can see, it goes from North Carolina, South Carolina, into Georgia, all over Georgia, all the way out to and then across Alabama, across uh, down to out of Mobile, out the Mississippi, out out across Mississippi. He never really lands in Mississippi, but the garden clubs there claim he does, which is okay. And they've got signs up and all of that. And then you go into Louisiana, and Louisiana has all kind of markers there because he spent quite a bit of time there looking for the white cliffs on the Mississippi River. And once he got there, the Revolutionary War had started and he was worried about daddy back home. And so he had headed home because things were getting dicey across the trail. So that's the Bertram Heritage Corridor that we're trying to get, have it designated at this point in time. So what does that look like in Florida? Well, this is what the corridor looks like in Florida. Basically what we do is take a 25 mile swath along his route, we know exactly his route. And if you could see this map easily, and I've, I've got copies of it over here, um, you can see actually where he traveled up and down into Florida and all the places that he went and all of that kind of good stuff. And that's what the corridor is. So we claim any trails or waterways that Bartram traveled on and all is part of the Bartram Heritage Corridor. And that's why when we in Palaka started the uh, Putnam County Bartram Trail, we include hiking, biking, paddling, and the highways as well, because he actually traveled in those areas in different ways. So that's what the Kiridish Corps looked like in Florida. And, um, and so next, let's go on to the next one. And there's Jacksonville in there. So if, if you could see this, you could see all the dots here and the little blue lines where he comes down from Amelia Island and he uh, comes down um, through uh, uh, Callahan when the, in 1765 they came by land, right? And so he came down Callahan, the old uh, King's Highway, right across, crossed here all the way to St. Augustine. That was with his father in 1765. And in 1774, he took the land, the water route. So he came down, you know, down the Altamaha River, out the St. Mary's River, and, and uh, went to uh, uh, the islands up there and then um, came aboard at, at Amelia Island. And the Bartram Garden Club in Amelia Island has a monument there and it's designating that. And so the, uh, the county up there is, is gonna do what we've done down here. So, and he comes down and um, travels the intercoastal, comes down, gets his boat, and then he travels, uh, you know, about 200 miles on the St. John's River. So that's, but here in Jacksonville, next slide. These are, these are the locations that he actually writes about in, in travels. There's a bunch of them, so let's go through them. Um, click is Sawpit Bluff is up on the intercoastal near Amelia. There's Kingsley Plantation he visited. The uh, Fort Caroline he visited. Um, Newcastle Plantation is a location on, on the river there. And all uh, the Trout River, he talks about the Trout River. Um, Pottsburg Plantation is down near Mandarin. And uh, the Museum of Science and History, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Park Plantation is actually downtown, is where, where that was. The uh, Museum of Science and History is where the monument is in hiding. And the Davis Plantation is down in Mandarin and, um, and all. And then so is the Marshall Plantation. And so these are the places that he visited and all. And then there's the old King's Highway that he traveled out to St. Augustine on. And then uh, Doctors Lake and Black Creek, he actually went up and traveled on. So, so Duval County has 11 verifiable Bartram sites here. So what are we doing about that? Well, in January 2020, the Bartram Trail Society of Florida started working with Duval County to request of, uh, at the request of uh, Randy DeFore and ask her, and she asked us to come and talk to them. So we did, and the, um, the uh, Parks and Rec Department here signed a, a person by the name of Lauren to be the Bartram Trail and Duval Project Coordinator. And she's working on that. December of 2020, mapping and design and site designation was already done. And, um, and uh, currently funding is being explored by the Parks and Rec Department, and we're working with them to get that done. And then in January of 2021, St. Augustine Commission passed a resolution that their county would become a Bartram Trail in Florida as well. And Commissioner Nancy Sykes Klein was the champion of that. So that's what's going on here in Duval County. So we're still working with, with everybody to get all that done. You've, you've got all your mapping done and all that kind of stuff. Just a matter of putting it on, on paper. So we've done that in Duval County. 
We've done it in St. John's County. We've gone out to Alachua County, but it all really started in Palatka and, um, and all. So here's what the Bartram Trail in Florida will look like very shortly. Go ahead, click. There it is in Palatka, that's where it started. Volusia County was the next county that came on board and they have already established their trail, got their map and all that kind of stuff already done. And then um, uh, Duval County was the next in line. So we're working with them, St. John's County. St. John's County Bartram Trail is gonna be different. It's more of a land-based trail than the, than the water-based trail. Although he, you know, his plantation was in St. John's County, but he visited, there, there are places in St. Augustine where he actually stayed. So, um, so the Bartram Trail in, in St. John's County and St. Augustine especially. St. Augustine is what we call a Bartram Heritage City. So, and then uh, the last one to come on board here locally is uh, out of Page Prairie, the Page Prairie uh, in Alachua County. They're, they're gonna be building the Bartram Trail similar to the map that you've got for Putnam County. That's what we're hoping gets built um, through all these. And so you will have the thing. So the, you see that you know, things are happening and it's really, really cool to see it happening. It's, it's a lot of work. So my, my influence, I started in poor old Palatka and, and we got this thing going and then, holy cow, um, my, you know, I, I'm getting spread out <laughs> and all, but it's, it's really fun. And so, uh, and all of that, it's, it spawns so many different things. One of them is the Cultivating the Wild movie. So I would really recommend to the Garden Club that maybe they, that you all have a viewing of the movie sometimes, you get it online. And it's really good that it talks about six different Bartram, local Bartram folks, you know, one uh, uh, that, that uh, are not, not local here, but Southeastern, and how they are using Bartram's inspiration for environmental purposes. It's really an excellent, and the photography is awesome, the artwork's awesome, and it's free of charge, and, and you're welcome to it. And if you go down the bottom here, that's the, the website where you can, uh, you can stream it live. And I, I would really suggest that you, you do that as one of your programs. It's a 50 minute film, that's what it is. And then in addition to that, we've got a, a book, I've only got one called Travels on the St. John's River, which uh, again, the, was inspired by the, uh, by the Bartram Trail that was developed in Putnam County. And this was done by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Thomas Halleck. And uh, the first half of it is a compilation of John Bartram's and William Bartram's writings on the St. John's River. So instead of the 480 pages of travels, has anyone actually read travels or tried to read travels? Okay, right, that, that's me. Uh, you know, I haven't made it all the way through because when you get to chapters three, four, and five, it's all about my river. <laughs> you know, and really, I, and I really don't care about those mountains and all that, although it's cool. And, and, and all, and Alabama, I, I do care about and, and all that, but his adventures here in Florida are the coolest part of the book. But boy, William Bartram wrote in the King's English and uh, he didn't know what commas and periods mean and, uh, and run on sentences are just part of it, but it's literature, no less. It is, it is and some of it is, is poetry, which doesn't get me, and part of it is scientific, which is not my thing either. But, um, you know, I like the alligator fighting stories and the fishing and stories and all that kind of stuff. And all of that's in there. And it's really cool. And all but um, but travels is tough. But what uh, what Dr. Halleck did when he wrote this book was he took the best parts of that on the St. John's and put it into a book. And then my friend Dick France, on the, the second half of the book, takes all of the plants and animals that he identified on the St. John's River and he documents them and describes them and gives you the current scientific names and tells you where he located these, these plants and all. So if you're a gardener or a, a biologist or botanist, you know, this is a guidebook literally for travels. You can get it online. I've got one copy and, um, and all. And, um, and, and so it's, it's called Travels on the St. John's River. So that's another thing. We spawned a CD of Bartram songs. We've got those available for you uh, here as well. And the, the map that you've got is, is really special because this is what we're asking all of the counties to do is to create maps like this. And that map, if you flip it over and look at the back, there's a website down at the bottom there. 
And what the map is, is a virtual, is the virtual trail. If you go to that website, if the yellow marks that are on the map there, those are all sites that are detailed in, on the website. And you can actually read Bartram's, John Bartram and William Bartram's writings about that place. You know, when he writes about Palatka, again, part of the inspiration of this thing, when he writes about Palatka, well, you heard Billy talking about what he said about here in Jacksonville. That's pretty special. That's really inspiration. If you're a plant lover, you got to believe that Bartram had the right heart to do this thing. And so when he writes about Palatka, he talks about the Indian village and the, the young people who are naked up to their hips, fishing and shooting frogs with bows and arrows and how they ran away when they came close. And there were women hoeing corn. There were gardeners. The first description of the Indians that he has in the state of Florida were gardeners. Isn't that neat? And that's your heritage. <laughs> you know? And so that's the inspirational part that we get out of reading Bartram is because he loved this place a whole lot. And his inspiration carries on into travels and, um, and, and, and should become part of of what you do. Okay, so we've talked a lot and we've uh, showed you a lot. I also want to say about these prints, these are prints given to the Bartram Trail Society of Florida by the Natural History Museum of London. All of majority of Bartram's actual drawings were sent to Dr. Fothergill after his travels uh, and, and the book was published. And so that's where they are. And so we sent one of our uh, folks over there and with a letter from the chamber from the uh, uh, county commissioners of Putnam County and we said we want our stuff back you know and uh, and all and so they didn't give us our stuff back but you know what they did do they went to their scanner and they took Bartram's actual prints put them on the scanner and made full-size scans of his actual prints and sent them to us electronically and that's what we printed here isn't that amazing? These are the highest quality scans of Bartram's uh, art that exist here in the, in the States, and it's really neat. You need to come up and look at them closely because those are his words and, and his drawings on here. So it's really, really cool stuff that we've got. You have any questions? Yes, sir. All right, so uh, yeah, what we want to do is capture your questions. Um, so Daniel, if you wouldn't mind taking this and uh, getting the questions captured on the microphone. Thank you. Interest in the languages. Obviously, he spoke English, yes. but at that time period, all the Indian languages and Spanish and right. French. How did he handle language? But all and the next part of that is also money. He said he was sending back things to England. Right. But obviously, he's in a canoe up, right. uh, not right. far from a port. Right. And then there's money issues. How do you buy right. supplies? Oh, those British. <laughs> they knew exactly what they were doing. So Dr. Fothergill set up with a with a, um, a merchant in in carolina to keep billy's money and to keep billy supplied with money for travel and so forth and so that's how it was done father father gill set up with the guy in uh, charleston and charleston got with billy and billy and he he sent letters down to mr spaulding and mr spaulding was out at uh, amelia or not amelia what's the island above amelia island St. Simon. So that's where he was. Frederica was the name of the place where, where um, Spalding was. And so Spalding was also a good friend of who? Macintosh. And so that's how they got together. And so Billy networked with the trading companies for safety reasons and all of that stuff. That's why he stayed at the lower store, went to the upper store, went over to St. August, went over to the, Saint, the, the thing because that, uh, all that trading was done. So he was, he was well funded for that day. And as far as the language goes, when Billy got to uh, the lower store, there was a, a strange person there by the name of Job Wiggins. And Job Wiggins was, uh, you know, he had an Indian bride and he was, uh, he was multilingual. And so he served as his guide, as an interpreter, and his best friend while he was here in Florida. And all, and so when Billy actually left, Billy gave him everything that he was leaving behind. He gave that to Job Wiggins. And Job Wiggins was 
also uh, associated with the upper store. So, so Job Wiggins had, uh, I mean, if you read travels again, you'll see the old trader. That's who Job Wiggins was. And he was, all, he was with Billy almost every excursion that he went on. Yeah, so that's how it happened. And also remember, the Spanish had been here for 200 years before Billy ever showed up. And so he didn't blaze any trails, anything like that. And so the Seminoles that were here were, the, were new as well. And so the Seminoles were already Europeanized. So they didn't have bows and arrows. They had guns and knives. And, um, and they, uh, when we went to Spalding's lower store to excavate that place, we didn't find a whole lot of pottery. We found some, but we found more Wedgwood China. And so that's what they, they, were, they were fairly well off. If you, if you see the picture of uh, the long warrior, the long warrior is not wearing buckskins. He's wearing French braid cloth, and and uh, and all. So they were used to uh, to European stuff. So uh, Billy Barton didn't blaze any trails, but he sure was big on keeping the right relationships with the Indians. That was a big part of what he did. Thomas Jefferson actually asked him, "Would you tell me what the new United States policy ought to be on?" on uh, the Native Americans and said, Billy said, leave them alone. They've got their own religion. They've got their own laws. They've got their own culture. They don't need white man's taxes. That was what Billy said. <laughs> and Jefferson didn't like that answer. But anyway, <laughs> by, the, by the way, uh, Billy was, uh, was well known by the founding fathers. And uh, there's a famous painting in 1791, significant year of the, when the, uh, the uh, Declaration of, or not Declaration of Independence, but the, um, the, the what's the big document? Constitution, right? It was in uh, 1791 when it was uh, actually created, uh, ratified at the Constitutional Congress. And while the Constitutional Congress was, was meeting and they wanted to take a break, they would paddle across the river to Bartram's Garden. And so there's this famous painting of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and even um, Benjamin Franklin and his wife, we think, uh, sitting on the back doorsteps of Bartram's garden. It's, it's amazing how, how constant he was. Uh, John Bartram was also the founder with, with Benjamin Franklin of the, Bar of the uh, Philadelphia Philosophical Society, which still exists. And, um, and so the whole science community, Bartram was a part of that. When he got back from travels in 1776, um, he, um, or 1777, I'm sorry. Uh, he, uh, he, he was born and raised in that house that we, we had the slide on. And when you go up there, his, you know, his, his table is still there and all of that kind of good stuff. And so he did that, but, but they used him as a, uh, as a resource for botany, for uh, the bird stuff, Audubon and him had a very interesting conversation on how to draw birds and, and these kind of things. And he died in 1835 at the gardens as well. So it was a, kind of a neat story. He's a really neat individual. When he, was, when he came down here, he was 26 the first time. And seven years later would have been, what, four, uh, 33, 34 years old, yeah. That's, that's how old. His father was in his 60s when he came down and couldn't see very well. So he really needed a photographer. Billy the photographer. Isn't that neat? Yeah. So he was, he was good at drawing. Billy sold his first drawing when he was 14 years old. And so that's why Father Gill wanted him to come, is that that's the only kind of documentation that they could have. Now, Billy told y'all that he collected plants and made presses and everything. Those press plants still exist at the Bartram, at the uh, National History Museum in, in London. If you go to Gainesville or to the uh, University of Florida's um, website and go, go into the history section, you can actually see those, those press things and everything like that. They, they, they still exist and you can see them. It's re really neat. And again, they, do, they wouldn't give us those when they, but they still exist. It's really neat. Any other questions? Anyone else? 
I just want to thank both of you. What a fantastic presentation. Yeah, and to you. also say, I have seen the azure fields of Cerulean Ixia myself personally. Oh, so, yeah. So. <laughs> Take me with you next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah, there's a there's an Ixia chapter of the Native Plant Society here in town and, and all. And so, um, you know, they, that's what they're named for, Martin Ixia. He, the part that he loved about it was the daintiness of it, number one. And the color is what he talks about. And if you read travels, he describes the color. No. Any any other questions? If you want to take kids on a hike, the ages between six and twelve, what would be a, an easy hike for them? Well, there, uh, I believe there's several up here. Uh, uh, that that would be fairly easy. If you come to Palatka, we've got the Puck Puggy Trail at our environmental center. Uh, it was called the Palatka Waterworks, and uh, that's a really neat trail because it you know it goes along their marching interpretation, and they they have a gopher garden there, which a, a gopher tortoise garden. I'm sorry. Uh, so one of the only places that you can actually keep gopher tortoises there. And um, that was a big Bartram thing. But uh, so that's called the uh, Palatka Waterworks Environmental Education Center. And so they have the Puck Puggy Trail through there. Uh, the Wallaca State Forest, which again is uh, part of his area there, has several trails through there. If you look on, on our map, sorry. Map is done in two pieces. One is just to have the the whole thing, um, and that's what we call the front. Okay, this this has the whole the whole map, and the, the yellow dots are the places that he actually wrote about or visited. Okay, and again, all of those are interpreted on the website, so you can go and find out exactly what was said about those sites on the website. The other side of the map has QR codes, and if you zip those QR codes, um, there's one for hiking routes. And so there are, let's, let me count them, I think there's six. There are six hiking trails with maps and all that kind of stuff that are detailed there. And, um, and you can, uh, can zip those and, uh, you know, and, and download the PDF and print it, and then you'll know where to go. And, um, or you can call us and we'll be happy to either find somebody to go with you or whatever. And then they, they have the biking trails on here as well, and they have the, the paddling trails. And so we tried to keep the paddling trails. You know, it's 80 miles of water in Putnam County that he paddled on. So, you know, that's, that's although, you know, <laughs> that's a lot of paddling. <laughs> although people do it and, and, uh, and all, but, but what we tried to do is make them day paddles. So the, the paddles are six miles or less is what they are. So you can download those. So that's how this is done. And that's how we want to have done up here in Duval County. So you know where to go and how to get there. You know, um, so a lot of the trails, people, when, I, when we say trails, people think, you know, a walking trail. Well, again, you know, the, the Old Kings Highway is four lanes and, <laughs> and all. So you don't want to really go walking that. You can bike it, but we'd rather have reasonable walking trails designated uh, so that people can go and see the same things that B.R. Bartram saw in that area. That's why we call it a corridor. So those things are all done. And there are just hundreds of those trails in, that, in the entire corridor. And we're trying to get that all published for you. If you go to the bartramtrail.org website and click on Bartram Trail and click on Florida, it's all there, and uh, my my good friend Brian, uh, Brad Sanders writ, has written a book, um, uh, detailing in very great detail, area by area, state by state, and um, and Duval County is part of that, and he details all of the state parks and trails that are that are in those areas. So so all of that's all that's on our website. Any last questions? One more, yeah. 
There were obviously lots of things, places, rivers, plants, and animals that he never saw before. Think about the names that he came up with and that those names lasted or those were given to him. They're all in English. And obviously, French had their own names and Spanish had their own names. Right. And, and for the most part, when you read travels, you, you, you kind of recognize these places. You do. Um, you know, because he used the Indian name. He didn't change names and everything. So he named the Bartram Ixie, or the Bartram Ixie was named for him. Okay, there's a Bartram air plant he never wrote about, but we all see it out here on the river. That's the Bartram air plant that grows in the oak trees and stuff around here. Um, the Franklinia, he did name that at a request of his father and Benjamin Franklin, obviously. And there's about 40 or 50 plants that he did actually name. Now, if you go to Bartram Gardens and you know Joel Fry really well, he'll take you to his private stock. And up there is, what's the botanist's name that did the Latin? Linnaeus wrote a book way a long time ago, said this is how we ought to name plants. And sure enough, there in Bartram Gardens is the Linnaeus book, and you open the front flyleaf of the of cover of the book, and it says, property of William Bartram. And turn the page, and it says, from John Bartram. What a treasure. So John gave William the, the information. And again, William was, uh, was educated. He went to Benjamin Franklin's high school and, and college and all of that kind of good stuff. And, uh, and all, and so uh, John used William to to do a whole lot. William was was a smart guy, but he was an introvert, and he was not a businessman. You have to read the book. <laughs> it was, he, Benjamin Franklin tried to get him hired. He wouldn't do that, and they put set him up in a business in Charleston. Failed miserably. Gave him a plantation down at, at the Shands or at the Shands Bridge down in in. Uh, on Highway 16. If you go over the Shands Bridge, you'll see the marker there on the on the right side, going from uh, west to east. There's the marker of Bartram's plantation, and it's that cove in there is where his plantation was. And so, at the time, in order to have a plantation, you had to have slaves. It was a British law. If you we're going to give you land, you're going to develop the land, and therefore you got to have slaves in order to staff the thing. So. John Bartram and, and William especially was very much anti-slavery and all, but John Bartram's um, bequeathment to William was that property and six slaves, and it lasted six months. And uh, Billy, he, he, he wouldn't tell the slaves to do anything because he, you know, and he couldn't do what he needed to do to, to have, make the plantation run and all that kind of stuff. So. So it was very failed. And that's when we went through a period of time where the question was, where's Billy? Well, Billy absconded to St. Augustine, got a job with a cartographer or then uh, with a guy who makes maps down there and uh, did some of that and got shipwrecked and then finally wound up showing up back in Philadelphia after all of that and um, began writing his book. So it was really cool story. Yeah. Cool right. story. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Well, really can we it. give a big round of applause for <laughs> Sam Carr and Mike Adams? We are so lucky to have them here for this uh, amazing presentation. I hope you agree with me. Um, so as we wrap up, I wanted to share my screen real quick and let you know about a couple of things. Um, a reminder of a Sam Carr and Mike Adams contact information, which um, will be available on the blog post um, afterward. And uh, we're also gonna share it here in the chat. So there's Sam and there's Mike. And I wanna let you know about a couple of other uh, programs that are coming up. Um, some big events like the flea market. Are you excited about the flea market? I can't wait. Um, it is the ultimate opportunity to reuse and recycle. That's why it is a garden club program. And of course, there's a preview party because if you want the best stuff, you have to come the night before, um, which is on February 25th. Um, the main event is on February 26th. 
Um, you can, uh, it's the event is free. If you want to come to the preview party, it's free for members and it is $25 for non members. So there's definitely incentive to become a member. So you can come to that free preview party. Uh, also coming up, Blooms Galore and more, our giant plant sale, and much, much more. Uh, the preview party is on April 8th, and the main event is on April 9th. Uh, the whole campus is going to be taken over, and it's going to be a really great event, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Wanted to let you know that we did um, make a slight change. Uh, the designer distinction was scheduled for later this month. We have rescheduled it for April 28th. So if any, anybody in this room has purchased a ticket, you'll get a message very soon that says, hey, we're, we're rescheduling this. Um, so hopefully you can make that. If you can't, we will certainly refund your, your amount of uh, ticket price. Um, but uh, out of abundant caution, we really wanted to make sure that since it is a seated lunch, that everybody could be as safe as possible. So we have moved that to April 28th, and it is going to be amazing. Eileen Thompson, um, who just did some really great media um, this uh, earlier this week and is going to be appearing on uh, First Coast Connect and Riverside Live, um, River City Live. So um, look for those appearances. Um, she has an amazing business called Farm Gal Flowers out of Orlando. Um, she's done amazing arrangements for all sorts of cool um, uh, you know, businesses and that sort of thing. Um, so definitely a really great opportunity to have her come and speak and talk about locally grown flowers. A couple of horticulture programs coming up uh, really quick around the corner is Bird Habitats on February 1st with Jody Willis. And uh, this is a really great, um, uh, cool program because it's a combination of several organizations getting together. So Duval Audubon Society, ICSIA Chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society and Northeast Florida Sierra Club are partnering with the Garden Club to present Doug Tallamy of Homegrown National Park. who will be talking about his cool project, which is there's not enough um, national parks out there to create the habitat that we need. So you can grow your own, get your, get your yard on the map so that we can create a corridor um, connecting all these places so that uh, natural um, uh, uh, species can um, exist. And uh, it's all about uh, native species. And so he'll be presenting and then each of these um, uh, locally, uh, local, um, sorry, my brain is not working. Each of these um, local chapters of uh, these societies will be talking about ways that you can incorporate these things in your yard. Uh, we have a Fun with Flowers program coming up about greenery, how to make beautiful arrangements using greenery. And that is coming up on March something, I can't remember, March 10th. And, uh, and then we have a survey for our program today. We really wanna get your feedback. So please take our survey, we'll send it out afterward, but you can also scan this code, which is also available on the desk where you checked in. Um, so please just take a couple minutes to give us some feedback. Let us know what you thought about today's program and what kind of programs you want to see in the future. I want to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund once again for helping us make programs like this possible. And I want to thank Sam and Mike and Daniel and all of you for being here because if you weren't here, we would just be talking to ourselves, which is not much fun. All right. If you um, are here for your circles meeting, we have a couple of spaces in the back. Uh, I think Grove Park Circle and Alderman Park, maybe. Um, we're going to have a little meeting. And of course, please stop by the uh, table to speak to uh, Sam and Mike about uh, the Bartram Trail Society because lots of great information there. Thank you for joining us on Zoom, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, everybody.